All right, good evening. We are gonna do some planetary imaging. It has become clear to me from some comments that I've received and questions that I need to go into more detail of how I'm doing uh, everything that I'm doing. Um, sometimes when you've used something for a long time and it works really well, you forget how difficult it was for you to get it going. So um, as a reminder, uh, I have my 11-inch uh, Edge HD Schmidt Cassegrain telescope riding on a CGEM mount. It is connected to my computer here, my laptop, so I'm going to control it later via ASCOM. I have what I call an electronic finder. I've just replaced my finder scope with a small uh, guide scope. It's a 40 millimeter SV Boney SV165. I like the 40 millimeter because it has rings that you can point, whereas the 30 millimeter does not. Uh, riding in that, I have an SV305, an inexpensive um, planetary camera from SV Boney. Uh, the SV305C these days has an IMX662 sensor in it. It's the same sensor size, same pixel size, same resolution, same number of pixels, but it is a much better chip. Uh, these days. And uh, last I checked, uh, that SV305C could be had pretty cheaply. So if you want to do what I'm doing, get something like that. Of course, it's not the only camera that will work. Lots of people love lots of cameras. So I'm going to grab that guy. My scope is rotated on the mount so that uh, it is 90 degrees from vertical. And I'm just going to quickly go through the uh, polar alignment. I'm going to show you all the settings that I'm going to use. So I have the full capture area. Uh, I'm in RAW 16 mode. I'm going to set my exposure to two seconds. Okay. My gain that uh, I'm using here is 301. You'll need a different combination, a different gain for your camera if it's a different camera. Uh, I am using a dark that I shot this time, so that subtracts out hot pixels. You could, instead of using a dark, use hot pixel removal, but it's easy enough to capture a dark under capture dark. Cover the objective of your little finder scope, tell it how many frames to capture in average. Do you want to store them in the dark library? And this is critical. Uh, use that dark when you take it. Okay? And you can keep the individual dark frames if you want to do some post-processing as well. So uh, I'm not going to do that. I've already got a dark. So you'll notice I have no hot pixels in my image. Uh, I have my De Bayer preview off, uh, but this is a color camera. If I turn it on, you'll see uh, some color going on. And I have my white balance controls for this camera set to 128. They're all neutral. That's why the image is green. Okay, you'll see that color again when we do our polar alignment. All right, the ne next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you a couple of options that can help with polar alignment. It's nice and dark right now, so I have plenty of stars. I don't have to do this. But one thing that you can do is use some display stretch. So this is the stars without the display stretch. You see there, there's plenty of stars here. It'll be fine. But I can also, uh, that's probably too much turn on the display stretch something like that okay now I have plenty of stars why does this matter well uh, because when we go to tools polar align we have options here that I have glossed over in the in the past so usually I don't want to auto advance this will automatically advance to the next stage when the current stage is completed. That means it will detect uh, when you rotated uh, and it has a solution and it will automatically click next for you. I don't like that because it can grab onto a solution before you're quite ready and move on to the next stage. So let's not do that. Um, under the advanced control, allow small rotation angles. So normally we want to rotate the mount through about 90 degrees to get the maximum accuracy for the calculation. Uh, but if you have, uh, say, a Dobsonian on an equatorial platform, you don't have 90 degrees to rotate through. You have, at most, about 15 degrees. 
um, sometimes a little less. So if you have this checked on, it will allow you to polar align your equatorial platform for a Dobsonian. It won't be as accurate, but it will be plenty accurate for an equatorial platform. It'll be way more accurate than it was without it. Um, the star detection, uh, I long ago uh, arrived at these settings. So we have a little bit of noise reduction going on. We have a sensitivity that determines uh, how many more stars. So to detect more stars, you would increase this. If you have too many stars that is confusing it, you can turn this down, or if the detection is, is slow. So we're suppressing hot pixels. That's on by default. Sometimes I run without a dark. Uh, sometimes I forget to turn on uh, hot pixel suppression over here under subtract dark. So that just stays on. It doesn't hurt anything. Use the display stretch will use any display stretch uh, that I've, I've put over here just to make the stars more visible. By the way, if you see all of this stuff going crazy on your display histogram, that's because the display histogram is shown after all of these graphics are put on it. So we have lots of red boxes, yellow boxes, yellow text, white lines, all that crazy stuff is put on here after the fact. So that's why you see all of that happening. Don't worry about it. Uh, so when you look at the frames, you can see I've detected plenty of stars, 50 stars. It's using only 15 of them. It tells me what my field of view of this camera is, which is a nice thing. It's just about 2 by 1 degrees. It uh, tells me the pixel resolution in arc seconds, which is a super handy thing to have. And it tells me what are the coordinates in RA uh, in DEC. And it tells me what the solve time is, which, by the way, is uh, thousandths of a second. Okay, so the, the plate solver inside Shark Cap, I'm using the Sharp Solve plate solver, is super fast. So anyway, we've solved, and I'm going to hit the next button before I rotate my RA axis. Next. And then I'm going to just reach over, gently rotate the telescope around, put it on the RA alignment marks. It does not have to be perfect, but you want to get close. Okay, so now we've rotated, we've solved, and it's figured out where the uh, axis is, and you can see that it's terrible. I'm two degrees off. Uh, I have to eyeball this every time, so you never know what's going to happen. So um, now I'm going to press next again before adjusting the alt as. So let me just stop here and give you some advice about what to do if uh, sharp cap is not detecting enough stars here. Basically, if sharp cap is not detecting enough stars, it may be too early in the evening. The sky might be too bright. It might just need to be a little darker. Uh, if you feel like it's dark enough and it should be able to, to detect stars, but it's not, there's the most important thing you can do is turn up the exposure. Uh, turning up the exposure reduces the noise. It increases the signal to noise ratio. So I'm using two seconds here. If you have to use four seconds, use eight seconds, <laughs> use whatever you need to do uh, to get uh, stars to be detectable. If you have a, ga a camera that kicks into a high gain conver conversion mode at a particular gain, we'll try to get to that gain so that it kicks into the high gain conversion mode. The reason being the read noise will suddenly drop. Okay, and noise is your enemy when you're trying to detect stars. Another thing that you can do, um, this is not usually a problem, but you can subtract the background. So if you have a bright background, you can come in here under uh, simple offset that will just subtract the background. And by subtracting the background, then the ratio of the brightness of the stars to the background goes way up because the background has been subtracted. The other thing you can do is called blended offset. That subtracts the background but doesn't affect the brightness of the stars, so the stars stay bright. Okay, there's some other stuff, cool stuff that you can do, but usually you don't have to use any of that for polar alignment. All right.
Hope that makes... Oh, there's the blended offset. Didn't mean to do that. Let's put it back to off. Okay, so uh, let's fix our polar alignment. So first thing I'm going to do is make sure that everything is loose and hit next. So my error is two degrees, nine seconds, and I need to move to the right. So I'm just going to loosen my angle setting screws for the RA axis and just start moving. On my mount, it might start moving in the wrong direction at first, but it quickly catches up. Now I'm under a degree. Making big movements. It's very unusual that my elevation is off by so much. I'm thinking something got moved. All right, now let's switch our focus to the up and down error. Got a long way to go. Let it catch up. Always let it catch up. Usually do not want to overshoot. And I'm going to switch back to my right left. And I'm going to leave a minute or two of left right misalignment. That'll work. And the reason that I do that, I've mentioned this before, is if you have a lot of declination back, backlash, you don't want to be constantly switching your guiding from north to south, north to south, north to south. So by leaving a little left-right error, it enforces a continuous drift in one direction that the guiding can keep up with without switching. All right, but you do want to get your up-down as accurate as you can. It doesn't have to be crazy. 10 arc seconds, 15 arc seconds. I probably can't do better than that. I'm probably going to overshoot and give it a little, just a little kick. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. And... No, I've overshot. That's okay. Um, I'll leave it there. So now I'm polar aligned. Don't forget to tighten your alignment screws back down. Not super tight. You don't want to shift the polar alignment, but make them finger tight. And then we're polar aligned. If there's any questions about polar alignment, hit me up with comments and I will either answer them there or sometime later.